Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can review the Scott Peterson murder case. So I'll be taking a look at the timeline here and then some of the evidence from the prosecution and defense and then talking about some of the mental health personality and human behavior factors that played a part in this case. This analysis is based on information that has been reported. I'm not diagnosing anybody that is involved in this case, just speculating based on what could have happened in a situation like this. So taking a look at the people involved first, we have Scott Lee Peterson, who is 30 at the time of the murder, and this was back in 2002. We see Lacey Peterson, his wife, she was 27, and she was seven and a half months pregnant with her unborn son named Connor. And then we see another kind of key player in this murder case, Amber Dawn Fry. Amber Fry, she was also 27, and she was Scott Peterson's mistress. So the case kind of starts there, right? We see Scott Peterson has an affair with Amber Fry. Allegedly, he tells her that he's not married, so he's single, and he's looking for a long-term relationship. So they have a relationship that kind of heats up in a short period of time. And then we move to December 23rd, 2002. And this is the last time that Lacey Peterson was seen alive by people that she knew, right? So this was on December 23rd. Now, Scott Peterson claims that he saw her alive the next day, but that's different. There were some eyewitnesses that may have seen her that's kind of a different thing. In terms of, like, initially looking at this case, there's pretty clear evidence that she was alive on December 23rd. So what happens here is that after she's seen on December 23rd, Scott Peterson claims that they went home. They were home on December 24th, and that he left to go fishing around 9.30 a.m., and that she was in the house and alive. Now, he went fishing and came back and she wasn't there and eventually the police were called a little bit after 5 p.m. Now it's interesting because that's all we have so far, right? She was alive on December 23rd. Scott Peterson says she was alive on the 24th and he left and he came back and she was missing. Now the police came out and right away suspected that Scott Peterson had murdered his wife and Connor. They were thrown off by how calm he was, his kind of cool demeanor, and they're also thrown off by how he didn't seem to have a lot of questions for them. Now, it was a little while later when Connor's body was discovered, and shortly after that when Lacey Peterson's body was discovered. So a little bit after the bodies were discovered, Scott Peterson was arrested. He was arrested on April 18, 2003, near a golf course and what's interesting about his arrest is kind of what he had in his possession at the time when he was arrested. In his car, they found almost $15,000 in cash, four cell phones, survival and camping equipment, his brother's driver's license, and of course his own driver's license, and 12 Viagra tablets. So he'd also dyed his hair blonde. So this didn't look too good for Scott Peterson at this point, right? He looked like he may have been getting ready to flee. So as I mentioned, he was arrested, he was charged, and later on he was convicted of first-degree murder for Lacey Peterson's murder and second-degree murder for the murder of Connor Peterson. So Scott Peterson was sentenced to death for those convictions, and currently, as I'm making this video, he's still in prison appealing the death penalty. So now taking a look at the evidence for the prosecution and defense, I'm looking here at the entire picture, not just what was presented back at the trial. So when we look at the prosecution's case, their theory of the crime, it was actually pretty straightforward. They believed that Scott Peterson strangled or smothered Lacey Peterson on the night of December 23rd or on the morning of the 24th, but they didn't know when it happened, and they argued they didn't have to prove when it happened. They only needed to prove that it happened. They believed after that, when he went on what he called the fishing trip, he dumped the body in the San Francisco Bay. And his motivation would have been money, like life insurance money, and of course, the affair with Amber Fry. 
So taking a look at the evidence on the side of the prosecution, we see both physical and behavioral evidence. So in terms of physical evidence, they found a strand of hair in pliers on the boat, but I don't think this really was too convincing. They had this theory that Connor died on 1224, and they supported this theory by using an expert who testified about the fetal bones and how he measured them and how the time of death could be calculated with that measurement. But the expert used an incorrect method. He used a method that deviated from the method that he said he used. So that was problematic. They also had evidence about the dogs picking up Lacey Peterson's scent at the marina. But this is pretty interesting. The dogs were actually unqualified. I'm sure they were nice dogs. I don't have anything against the dogs. But evidently they were not qualified. They weren't very good or accurate at their job. And also the method that was used, the way the dogs were used, was actually incorrect. And one example of this is the scent. They gained the scent from cross-contaminated items. So items that Lacey Peterson touched and used, but also items that Scott Peterson could have touched or used. Now recently we see that an expert has weighed in on this and indicated that the searching protocols that were used in the case were virtually guaranteed to produce an unreliable result. So the dogs really weren't used correctly and again they didn't appear to be qualified. The prosecution also called an expert who was supposed to understand how bodies would move in water because again with the theory of the crime Scott Peterson must have dumped the bodies but of course they washed up somewhere else and the prosecution had to explain that difference and they explained it through this so-called expert. But as it turned out, on the stand, this individual admitted that he had done no studies, he had no education or expertise in terms of how bodies move in water. He also indicated, and I think this is particularly important, that he was aware of the prosecution's theory of the crime. Now it's interesting because his testimony was key in getting the convictions on Scott Peterson. And yet he's saying he really doesn't know what he's doing, and he was aware of what result he was supposed to find. And I'll talk about this more in a moment. Now we also see that one of the detectives said that the house smelled like bleach. Turns out there was no evidence to support that. And we see that there was really no evidence anywhere else. There was no evidence on Scott Peterson, in his boat, in his yard, in his house, in his vehicle, anywhere. So this just seems kind of unusual that there be no physical evidence at all on Scott Peterson or the places where he would have needed to be in order to commit the crime. Now getting into the behavioral evidence, and I think this is particularly interesting because we see this in a number of cases, right? We see that there was this feeling that the police had that Scott Peterson was too calm, also that he was keeping secrets, so allegedly he kept the fact that he had a boat secret from Lacey Peterson. We find out, of course, that this wasn't true. And really what the police were saying was Scott Peterson was not reacting in the right way. And I'll talk more about this in a few moments. So now moving over to the defense. Well, the defense had a few different components. They challenged, of course, the prosecution's assertions. They indicated that the timeline could be accounted for, right? So Scott Peterson went fishing, and they kind of showed the different steps in that, going to the warehouse, getting the boat, towing the boat to the marina, all this. And they also looked at this idea that he didn't lie, right? There weren't lies told in the beginning, and then you see him changing his story. That didn't seem to happen. And usually when people are guilty of murder, they do change their story once or maybe even more. So he didn't appear to lie. He went fishing and came home, and that seems to be supported by quite a bit of evidence. Now I mentioned before the prosecution had that witness that testified about the length of the fetal bones to establish when Connor had died. And the defense called a witness to counter that prosecution witness. And this witness was going to testify that the unborn son, Lacey Peterson's unborn son, lived until well after the mother was reported missing. So that would of course kind of tear apart the prosecution's case. Now this individual, his name was Dr. March, he was a fertility expert. And on the stand he kind of came apart under cross-examination. So when the prosecution was asking him questions, he kind of came apart and he said he was sorry, that he made an error, and he even asked the prosecutor 
to cut him some slack. This actually happened on the stand. So this was fairly devastating to the defense. Other evidence they had, though, was that there was a burglary that was committed in the house across the street from the Petersons on December 24th. Now, this gets a little mixed up because the prosecution had a different theory about when it happened, but that was still something the defense brought up. So if there were burglars there, then it makes sense that those burglars would be dangerous, so it offers an alternate theory of the crime. And there were also a number of witnesses that saw Lacey walking her dog after Scott Peterson already left to go fishing. So if that's true, if Lacey was walking her dog after Scott Peterson left, there's no way he could have committed the murder. So that was a good point for the defense. Of course, ultimately, the defense failed. And Scott Peterson, of course, as I mentioned, was convicted and sentenced to death. So now moving to my thoughts on this in terms of a mental health, personality, and human behavior aspect, and also my thoughts on whether Scott Peterson is guilty or not guilty. So obviously I don't know for certain. I don't know if he did it or not, but I will offer my opinion on this. And I have a lot of difficulties with this case. I have a few different problems about what happened in this case, the kind of procedures that were followed, and how they didn't really follow the scientific method, and really didn't represent good investigative practices, and how really Scott Pearson's behavior was used against him in a way that doesn't seem to be really supported by scientific evidence. So in terms of that aspect, in terms of his behavior, we see that in this case there's really a certain way that somebody's supposed to act when someone dies. And Scott Peterson didn't act that way, and that kind of got him in trouble, right, in terms of the investigation. But this brings up an important point. Do we really know how somebody's supposed to act when their spouse is missing, or when they've committed a murder, or both? Murders are not that common, and people going missing really isn't that common either, right? If you go and talk to a married couple that's been married 10, 20, 30, or say 40 years, and you ask them, how many times has your spouse gone missing? a lot of them will probably say it's never happened. So we don't really have a lot of observations of these kind of extreme situations on which we can make these judgments. There is no normal way to act. There is no correct way to act. Or if there is, it hasn't been established through scientific research. So we don't really know, yet again, this was really used against Scott Peterson. I've seen people react in all kinds of ways to all kinds of stressful and unusual situations, right? Terrible things will happen in people's lives and they'll be calm and collected and kind of even calculating sometimes. Other times I've seen events occur that seem really minor or just routine and people have incredibly strong dramatic reactions. So I'm not really kind of buying this argument that there's a certain way to act when bad things happened and that he didn't act that way. The bottom line here is that the police believed he was supposed to be distressed, crying, and inconsolable, and he wasn't that way. So what happens, and this is why this is a problem, what happens here is that little misinterpreted observations, so small things that the police saw, lead to more significant events, like the police obtaining search warrants. So really, Scott Peterson's behavior, right, his demeanor, kind of directed the investigation. So this really brings up this argument about the role of the police, right? It's their job to collect evidence and to find the truth. They have to be open to the truth, whatever the truth is. So that includes that Scott Peterson may have been not guilty of this and somebody else was responsible. But instead they used Scott Peterson's behavior to form their theory of the crime. Again, it directed the investigation. They did this with no mental health training, yet they used his personality and his behavior to make important decisions. Now, as I mentioned, I've been a counselor for a long time. I've seen people react in all kinds of situations, and I don't know what to make of Scott Peterson's demeanor. That's with years of training and experience. So how could it be that these detectives were able to draw all these conclusions from really this short period of time, right? There's this idea that this behavior indicates a state of mind, not like a long history, not like we see in counseling, where we can work with people for a long time and kind of see patterns, but just this brief behavior, really this momentary interaction with Scott Peterson, leads to this inference about his state of mind, and eventually, of course, helps build the case against him. So you could argue, of course, that momentary behavior has meaning, but I think 
my argument would be that look at just behavior that happens quickly in isolation, and there could be a lot of explanations there, right? It's not always clear. Like if somebody's crying, that could mean that they're sad, that could mean that they're acting, or that could mean that they just laughed a lot. Sometimes when people laugh really hard, they cry at the same time. Or somebody could be smiling, and somebody could say, well, if that person's smiling, they're happy, or they're thinking pleasant thoughts, or they're up to no good. It could be that they're just physically smiling. They could be faking that smile. So if we only have a brief interaction to deal with, it's very difficult to draw conclusions. If you work with somebody for years, and you see they tend to smile in like socially inappropriate situations, then you have a pattern to work with. Then you can say, okay, I've seen them manifest that behavior many times, and there's a theme or pattern available there. But a brief interaction is not enough to establish a pattern. So my theory about this part is that we really just ask too much of police officers. I don't think these police officers were necessarily bad or anything like that. I think we just ask too much of them. I call it the James Bond theory of police work, right? If we look at James Bond, like in the movies, he was good at everything. He was an excellent driver. He knew how to operate a number of different types of weapons, including rifles and pistols and explosives. He could pilot anything, a jet fighter, a helicopter, a boat. He was great at hand-to-hand -hand combat. He understood technology, and he had fairly good social skills, although, of course, this would be debatable, I suppose. So James Bond really could do everything, but real people can't. And we see a number of examples in this case of this happening. We see one of the detectives talking about a witness that saw Lacey Peterson alive when Scott Peterson already left, and he said that he didn't think that occurred because it didn't happen. She was already dead by then, meaning Lacey Peterson. So he had already formed his conclusion and then was finding or excluding evidence based on that conclusion, right? Because in his mind, Lacey Peterson was already dead, that witness didn't say that she wasn't. That was the logic being used there. We also see that those burglars that burglarized the house across the street, they were eventually arrested. Their names were Stephen Todd and Glenn Pierce. And when they were arrested, they said, no, that didn't happen on the 24th. It happened on the 26th. Because, of course, we know that burglars would never lie, right? So this was really what the police were thinking. The burglary was okay with these two people, with these two men, but it would somehow violate their values to lie. So burglary, that's okay, but lying is where they draw the line. This is actually what the police must have believed. Now, of course, they were trying to fit the evidence to the theory of the crime. But it's interesting because there was a guard in a nearby prison who monitored a phone call between an inmate and the inmate's brother. And on that call, the inmate's brother said that Stephen Todd, one of the burglars, admitted that he was confronted by Lacey Peterson on December 24th, 2002. Now, there are other factors involved here, too, just not mistakes that the police might have made. We see that we have in Scott Peterson somebody with no history of anger or violence. So it doesn't seem likely that somebody like that would commit this type of crime and leave no evidence, physical evidence, behind at all. Again, not in his truck, not in the boat, not in the warehouse, not on his person. And he did all this in broad daylight, and there were no eyewitnesses. Now, there were eyewitnesses that saw Lacey Peterson alive after Scott Peterson went fishing, but there were no eyewitnesses that saw him commit this crime. Now, there were witnesses that saw Scott Peterson. For example, he was observed at the boat ramp, and they said there was really nothing unusual about his behavior with the boat. They didn't see, like, a human-sized bag being loaded on the boat or being in the boat. So the witnesses that did see Scott Peterson really don't have testimony consistent with what we see in terms of what the prosecution was saying happened. Now at this time, as I'm making this video, there are 11 eyewitnesses that claim to have seen Lacey Peterson after Scott Peterson had already left. So when you think about things like reasonable doubt, with the strength of the prosecution's case, meaning it's a fairly weak case, how many witnesses would somebody need here to say, okay, there's reasonable doubt? Again, there are 11 people saying that they saw her. How many would be necessary? How many could be wrong and there would still be reasonable doubt in this case? So this brings me to my thoughts in terms of guilt or Scott Peterson 
being not guilty, right? So, of course, the answer, as I mentioned before, is I don't know, but I will speculate and offer my opinion here, and it really just is my opinion. So if we start with some of the kind of the key points of the case, right? Was Scott Peterson a good guy? Well, he was having an affair, and apparently he had an affair before that. So by that standard, it doesn't seem like he was a good guy, and I think that hurt him. Was he suspicious in this case? Was his behavior suspicious? Yes, right? Being calm and having a cool demeanor and all that does seem suspicious, but I talked about how that might not mean anything. So what about in terms of like preponderance of the evidence? If I think about this and say, is there a 51% chance that he did it, in, in my opinion, right? Well, criminal cases, of course, aren't decided by preponderance of the evidence, but I'll give my thoughts on this. I really thought about this a lot, and initially I thought that he probably did do it. And I think that, for me, it was the timing with the affair. But as I look at the timeline and the lack of evidence, and the other evidence in this case, I'm kind of left on the fence, maybe even leaning toward, I don't believe they did it. I mean, I believe there's a chance he did it, but not a 51% or greater chance, right? So that's kind of where I am right now. I'm really not sure. Now, this moving on kind of speaks to where somebody might be with reasonable doubt, right? Was there reasonable doubt in this case based on what I know, based on the evidence that I've seen, and just my opinion? I think there clearly was. So he may have done it, I don't know, but there does appear to be reasonable doubt here. So who knows what's going to happen in this case. Maybe Scott Peterson will be executed. Maybe his sentence will be commuted. Maybe he'll get a new trial. I don't know what will happen. But I think either way, this is a great example of how bad science can be problematic, right? Especially telling people who are doing tests what you need them to find. That's not how science works. And also, I think, just a lack of awareness about how people work, how we can misinterpret people's reactions, and this can really move people into focusing on something that they would not have focused on. So if someone else had committed this crime, the police really weren't looking for that person or those people. So there's a lot of great information, a lot of valuable information we can learn from a case like this. And I think that in terms of what happens with Scott Peterson, I think he deserves a new trial, but again, that's just my opinion based on the information that I know. We'll have to see what happens there. I know that with the system of justice in the United States, it's very clear in our system that we would rather let 10 people who are guilty not be punished than punish one person who is not guilty. So that's important to keep in mind when we look at kind of this case and kind of frame it in the context of the justice system in the United States. So I know that the Scott Peterson case is a controversial case, and a lot of people have strong opinions in both directions. There are a lot of people that believe he's absolutely guilty and that he should have already been executed or he should be spending his life in prison. And there are many people who believe that he's not guilty, and they're very sure that he's not guilty. So with all these strong opinions, if you agree or disagree with me or have other opinions, please put those in the comments. I think they will generate an interesting dialogue about this case. As always, I hope you found this description of the Scott Peterson murder case to be interesting. Thanks for watching.